field of study is something called clinical psychology. And clinical psychologists are mental health professionals that help support people with their mental well-being. We help people with mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety. You may have heard these terms, depression and anxiety. Both terms are clinically diagnosable issues that benefit from both professional and therapeutic support. Some of you may know people who have struggled with these issues, or maybe you've struggled with them yourself. However, the words depression and anxiety are now commonplace words used in our everyday language. We tend to use anxiety to refer to states of uncertainty, states of intense stress, or states of not being able to cope. We tend to use depression to refer to states of being overwhelmed, not being motivated, feelings of low mood and sadness. You see, what I've noticed today is that our society has become a lot more attuned to this idea of mental health, especially the younger generation which I belong to. In fact, globally, psychological distress among young people has been steadily increasing. And this trend has continued upwards over the last decade. It is not surprising then that we are naturally sensitive to mental health simply because of the current conditions of our world and society today. Look around us. The cost of living has gone up. It's increasingly harder to find a job. It requires much more study than what used to be the case. Job markets are competitive and threatened by the rise of AI. There's a growing and consistent global socio-political and environmental unrest. What's more, a global pandemic has caused intense levels of disruption and uncertainty across all facets of our lives. Although we have instantaneous gratification in the form of food delivery, catered video reels, and online shopping, we're also plagued with media content that tells us about the things we need to be concerned and worried about in the world. Globalization and technological innovation have meant that we have an abundance of choice and so-called opportunity, but we don't necessarily know what the right path is for us. What's more, there is little guidance on what a right path is. You might be asking yourself these same questions. What does the right job look like? What does the right relationship look like? What does the right life look like? When faced with all of this, it is no wonder that we feel anxious or depressed. It's no wonder that we struggle with our mental health. First, we need to understand what this idea of mental health is, because in order to improve something, you have to first know what it is. If I asked you in the audience what good mental health looks like, what would you say? Have a think about it for yourself right now. Do you know what good mental health looks like for you? It's hard. It might have loose associations with ideas of happiness, maybe feeling like part of a community, having good relationships, or having achieved something but it's hard to rest upon something tangible. Let's make it harder with a second question. How do you improve and uphold good mental health for yourself? If you're struggling with the first question, the second one will be even harder. See, what's interesting is if we apply these questions to physical health, it's more tangible. The answers come easier. We might say that good physical health looks like being in shape, eating well, being mobile, and not getting sick. We are also very clear about the actions we can take to improve our physical health. Yet when it comes to figuring out how to take care of our mental health, the answers are quite elusive. Why are they elusive? I think it's because mental health is not something we specifically get taught to think about or be aware of. One definition from the World Health Organization conceptualizes mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. This definition shows there are several components. A flourishing component, that good mental health is a sense of being able to realize your full potential. Coping with the normal stresses of life, that life is inherently stressful and that part of being well is being able to move forward and cope with difficulties. Working productively, that good mental health is about the production or creation of something that is of use to us or other people and a contribution to community, that we are doing something for and in relation to others. After looking at this definition, it might not have been what you had in mind. It wasn't mine when I first read it. But if, we, if I really stop to think about the parts of my own life when I feel in a mentally healthy state, some of it fits. Some of my happiest moments have been when I feel like I'm doing good work, I'm around good people, I feel like I'm valued and matter to others, and I'm able to get through the day having achieved something, whatever it might be. 
But this definition is a bit like a north star of what mental health looks like. Like physical health, one's mental health journey is unique to everyone. The definition here is the what of mental health. But what's missing is the how. And this is the question you might be asking yourself. How the hell do I flourish, cope with the normal stress of life, work productively and contribute to my community amidst all the cocktail of stresses that constantly seek to throw me off balance every day? So, like any good 21st century citizen with access to the internet, we asked Google. Before doing this talk, I asked Google how to take care of my mental health, and I popped up with several answers. What are they? Talk to someone you trust. Do things that you enjoy. Be positive. Exercise. Meditate. Just relax. Be grateful. Just find someone to hang out with. There we go. As simple as that. I'm not so sure. You see, it's not that these tips aren't correct. They do have benefits. We know that having good relationships improve psychological well-being. Meditation and gratitude are psychological practices that have been shown to reduce psychological distress. But here's the thing. It is exceptionally hard to do these things in the first place. Now, I'm talking about a lot of intangible and abstract terms. So I want to get concrete with you by way of an example. I want to paint you a picture of why it's hard to do these things that Google suggests. Let's say it's an average student day. We're at the university, so I'll give us an example of a student day. You go to study at university and have a particularly stressful commute. You subsist on coffee for most of the day. You go to lectures and wonder what this content means in the grand scheme of your life and your career. You might worry about whether you're on track with your coursework and realize that you actually misread the deadline and that the deadline is actually one week earlier than you thought it was. You then have to go to work with your part-time job that you absolutely hate, and that makes you have a little less faith in the human race. <laughs> At the end of the day, you are tired and stressed out, and all you want to do is go home and have something good to eat, preferably something carb-loaded, and maybe unwind for a few hours. But then you get waylaid by doom scrolling on social media and making comparisons about yourself in relation to other people who you will probably never meet or know. And by the time that you actually realize that you've been scrolling for two hours, it's time to go to sleep. But before you can even get to sleep, you get pulled into some ongoing friend drama that really should have been sorted out by now. Your friends, while you love them, sometimes have no sense of boundaries. And so you spend time helping them when you really should be just taking care of yourself. And then, you realize that you forgot to go grocery shopping and you'll be out of cereal and milk for the next morning. And that just slightly annoys you because of all the things you could be responsible for, it surely could just be your own damn breakfast. But you can't even be responsible for that. So you go to sleep, irritated, annoyed, and just tired. And it's the only, the beginning of the week. And it's only just one day. You see, I can stand here and rattle off all the things that may help our mental health, but these just become things on the list of things we have to do. We get caught in vicious cycles and struggle to find the energy to get out of them. It's easier to not do these things rather than do them. These cycles are a whirlwind of different emotional and environmental situations. We are constantly at the whim of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and most days, they tend to get the better of us. Existentialist philosopher Albert Camus likened life to rolling a boulder up a hill. In this case, a figure from Greek mythology, Sisyphus, rolls a boulder up a hill only for it to keep rolling down. This reflects our own vicious cycles. We get trapped in them and our mental health suffers. But being trapped in cycles is one of the reasons that clients come to therapy. And my work as a clinical psychology trainee, I see clients that have identified that things aren't working for them. Part of the therapeutic process is to help our clients break difficult cycles. One way of doing this is getting them to break down moments of emotional distress. We get them to name the situation, ask them the type of thoughts, the physiology they are experiencing, the emotions they are having and the behaviors they do in response to these other aspects. We help create awareness about their own internal worlds. 
This allows them to recognize what they are feeling and produce the impetus for change. See, our lives are cycles and we have to find a way through these cycles. Now, this is a process that you do not need a therapist for. It is something you can do for yourself. My challenge for you all is that the next time you catch yourself feeling in a state that's making you feel misunderstood or not happy, then get curious and try to understand yourself. You might ask yourself, what am I actually feeling in this situation? What am I actually thinking? How am I behaving? And in relation to these thoughts and these feelings and these behaviors, are these things detrimental or helpful for my well being? See, often we don't take the time to actually undergo this process because the answers are not easy. They don't come immediately. However, with time and practice, you can get better at it. We're very good at doing this with our physical health. Notice that when we ask, how are you feeling? We can articulate it. But if we ask someone about their mental state, how are you feeling? It's a different answer. It's difficult to articulate. By asking these questions of our mental states, it allows us to be aware of how we are feeling. It allows us to pay attention to ourselves. The famous Austrian psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who survived the Holocaust, puts it well. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and our freedom. What is this response? This response is to just pay a little bit more attention, to be a little bit more aware, and to be a little bit more reflective. Why? It's too hard. Yes, it is hard. And it is hard because we have not learned how to do this well. But you see, awareness gives us power to move towards something better. Awareness gives us space to understand ourselves and the things that derail our mental health. It allows us to take action for our mental health, just like we would with our physical health. Have a think about something that's bothering you right now. We all struggle with relationships. Have a think about a relationship that you're currently struggling with for whatever reason. It could be friends, family, at work, romantic. And ask yourself, what's really bothering me about this relationship? What am I feeling? Is it annoyance, anger, sadness? Go deeper, get curious. Why am I feeling like this? What type of thoughts are coming up for me? What is this relationship making me feel? See, here's where the power of self-awareness is important. It's telling you that something's not right, something that's causing your mental state to not be in the best place it can be. This self-awareness allows you to do something. Maybe it's a clue you can communicate how you feel to someone else. Maybe it's a clue you need to move away from this relationship. Or maybe you just want to connect more with the relationship. This process we can do at any moment of our lives. By tapping into our mental states, we allow ourselves to connect with our emotional worlds. And this information is valuable because we connect and respond in a constructive, healthy manner. We become proactive rather than reactive. We're less likely to get trapped in cycles when we're actively aware of what might be causing them in the first place. Now, as I stand here, please don't think that I'm intending to present myself as something who's figured out the secret to being mentally well. I stand here as a trainee psychologist, complete with my own flaws, my own biases, my own bad days. But what my experiences, both professionally and personally, have told me is that we must pay attention to our mental health in the same way we do our physical health. We should know our minds the same way we know our bodies. In a world of fast-paced change and uncertainty, paying attention to your mental state is crucial. If we can figure out that something is not right, it allows us to focus our attention, not get distracted by other things. Focus 
problem solve, figure out how we can improve ourselves, have better habits, and seek help. We can improve our relationships with ourselves and others, and we move in the right direction. We turn the dial in the right direction towards flourishing, towards productivity, towards contribution and connection with others, towards good mental health and a good life. Paying attention to our mental health is hard, but it does get easier. Every day, it gets a little easier. But here's the thing, you have to do it every day. That's the hard part. I wish you all the best. Thank you.